Good evening and welcome back to our study in the Minor Prophets as we continue through the book of Zechariah. Uh, tonight we'll be going through chapters 9, 10, 11. And, there, and, and you know, even as I begin to study these and I go back and I study them, even after we're done here, I continually get more what God wants to show me, reveals more to me. And, and as we get into these final chapters or the section of Zechariah, uh, essentially in the next three chapters, 9, 10, 11, we're going to deal with the prophetic with the first coming of Jesus Christ primarily, but there will be some references to the second coming. Um, and then the final three will have a majority later. Uh, but now these prophecies that we're going to hear were 500 years before Christ was born, uh, where he stepped on, on the earth the first time. Roughly 500 years, uh, not only will Zechariah speak of Christ's first coming to the earth as an infant, but also uh, speak later <clears throat> in the later three chapters of this book. Of the second coming, which is we know is obviously still future. Now you remember the Old Testament is, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Is uh, God speaking to His people, give for guidance and wisdom, <clears throat> and to tell them of the Messiah, of who their Messiah is, and so that we will see that the Lord has some things to say, various things that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, we also look at that what the Lord will say as a nation that would reject their Savior. Can you imagine, though, Jesus be coming to, to his people and them rejecting him? Uh, <clears throat> this will be a fascinating section here that as, as we look at the Jewish Messiah, Messiah, who is largely, largely rejected by his, his own people. And will we hear what God has to say to those people who reject the Messiah? It, it, it's it's, it's kind of interesting that um, how, how, you know, it's just, it's just a great divine orchestration of how God just put the Bible together. I think it's just pretty cool. <clears throat> but as we start in chapter 9, we'll also look at uh, God's pronouncement on the judgment on the neighboring peoples, or if you want to say countries to Israel, for their long opposition, or their long stand against their opposition to Israel, but also for their own personal wickedness. We know that, you know, uh, Israel was taken over, but also some of these countries, if you go back and see some of the different... Um, the passages, the stories that we see in the Old Testament, some of the, the countries were really brutal with their people and with the enemies. Um, they didn't hesitate to just chop people down. But we're going to pick up in chapter 9 tonight. Um, it should say, Judgment on Israel's Enemy. Let's go with uh, chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> the oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrish and Damascus and its resting place. For the Lord has an eye on mankind and on all the tribes of Israel and on Hamath, which also which borders it, Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a rampart, has heaped up silver like dust and a fine gold like mud of her streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her possessions and strike down her power on the sea and she shall be devoured by fire. Ascalon shall see it and be afraid, Gaza, too, she shall write thee in anguish. Ekron also, because of hopes are confounded. The king of per shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in, in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth, and the abominations from, uh, from between its teeth. <clears throat> it too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Now, the Jebusites were um, were people who lived in Jerusalem. Uh, if you remember the story, when King David had taken over the city and named it after himself, uh, he brought it, it into the southern kingdom. These people were, some believe they were never conquered, but they were they were, they were absorbed into the city. It's kind of like <clears throat> it's kind of like David brokered a a friendly deal. And with them, and we know if you if you read on in, in Samuel, Second Samuel and Ezra, remember when um, they they worked the Jebusites worked for Solomon, but um, as as like a, a labor force. <clears throat> but it is dangerous part is that when they were absorbed into 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 the, into the city of the two God's people, they kept their own customs, and and that's important that uh, we understand that because you know. What 
it's almost like they were allowed to continue to do their, their what they were taught, how they wanted to do it, and it didn't stand for what God wanted them to do. You know what I mean? Sometimes we allow things in our lives that should not be allowed. And here David allowed them to keep their kind of their religious customs and their ideas while living in this, the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> but in verse 8 says, Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that no one shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them, for now I see with my own eyes. Now, this is something still future here, that in the Lord is giving a prophetic insight. There will be no longer any enemies will be in that day. That the, There will be no more enemies in Israel that will come against them when, God's, when God comes back and sets up his uh, millennial kingdom. Uh, the Lord is telling them that there will be a day, a future day, that they will have no more adversity. Can you imagine a time that we have no adversity, no issues, no problems, and everything is just going great. It's going good. And <clears throat> there will be a day that this does happen for all of us who are in Christ. And it's something that we need to get excited about. But God is saying to his people, this is what's going to happen. And um, this is a future event. Uh, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, a fowl of a donkey. Now, this single verse here we can see is quoted in the New Testament when Jesus came through the gates of the city. We call it the triumphal entry. We call it Palm Sunday. Uh, so let's real quickly uh, turn to, <clears throat> but keep your finger in Zach, Zechariah. Let's go a few hundred years into the future. Go to Matthew, book uh, book of Matthew, chapter 21, if you don't mind. Uh, what's unique about this is that Jesus is allowing for his public acknowledgement to him being the Messiah. Up to this point, everything was done in private, basically on the down low. Uh, his time had not come in revealing who he was. Uh, now he is allowing them to declare him uh, Messiah. So let's go to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to verse, read verses 1 through 11. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent his two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied to a colt with her, and tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs of them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and a colt, a fowl of the beasts of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. And he brought the donkey and the colt and put, it, put on the, them the coats, and, um, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks and on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went before him, and they followed him, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered in Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, as we can see from this passage, they, they quoted from Zechariah 9. So let's go back to Zechariah 9. <clears throat> and, and notice what the prophecy said about Jesus, that he is coming. Related to this is that, he comes to you righteous and speaks of his character and his ministry. It also speaks to him of having salvation. And we know from our point of view or how we look at th back at this, Jesus meant salvation from his, like from uh, from from sin, salvation from the bondage of sin, from his death on the cross, his resurrection, which will come three days later. Um, but we know that what. What, why Jesus came. We know because we look back and we see the whole story basically <clears throat> where as the Jews did not. The Jews were thinking about it uh, from the prophecies in Zechariah 9. Salvation uh, necessarily didn't mean, mean uh, from sin, but they were looking or thinking salvation from their enemies. Um, number one on their list and thought the Messiah was a victorious king to cause their enemies to flee. That's what they were looking for. And that's kind of what they missed um, even in the New Testament. Uh, see, they were totally unprepared for Jesus to come as a suffering Savior, even though that many prophecies or many prophets telling them of his role and his ministry to come and to suffer for sin for mankind. Now, he was perfect. He was sinless, but he was the uh, sinless sacrifice. That sacrifice that 
that that would would um, appease God, God what God was asking for, and then you know, <clears throat> and it's it's hard sometimes because you know we miss some things because we don't study it, and how often do we miss things in our lives because we just don't see, we don't, we're not sitting in the Word, we're not we're not hearing what the Holy Spirit, and we get so distracted. And see, some believe a lot of the Jewish people were atheists. But there are a few who do believe and see uh, through the references of the scripture of the suffering servant, like in, since I, it's in Isaiah, I think chapter 52 or 53, uh, but they see themselves as they're the suffering servants, not the Messiah. Even in this day, <clears throat> even at that day of Jesus was there when he came to earth, when, he, when, he, when this all was going on, uh, they wanted a conquering uh, Messiah. But see, the Old Testament prophets spoke of both uh, a suffering Messiah, but also a conquering Messiah. But sometimes, to be fair with the Jews, is there was no really no time frame for back then. In the Old Testament, they would speak both suffering and conquering in the same breath. So we know that the suffering Messiah, the cross meaning, had already come and conquered Messiah, had yet to come to take the church up and destroy the enemies of the future. We know that he has to still come. There's <clears throat> he did the first part, but when he comes back to bring peace on the earth um, and to and to set up his kingdom, but that's a future event. But for them back then, the Messiah to them was someone that was a conquering king, and yet a Messiah that, that someone that they missed. They missed who Jesus was. And the end of verse 9 says, Humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now, traditionally, if a king if a king came in on a donkey, represented he came in peace, and, and time from time to time this did happen. <clears throat> now, if a king came in on a stallion, he came as a conqueror, kind of like what the Romans did. So you have Jesus who comes in on a donkey or a fowl, and then you have um, you have the government officials of Rome who would come in with an entourage of soldiers. He would be on a horse and. He would be well protected. And when Jesus came on a donkey, they missed it because he came not to overthrow the Roman government, which they thought he was going to do. But he came to save souls, to bring man and give man a choice to come back. Or what really, it is our choice, but he came to bring man back into right relationship with the Heavenly Father. But it's our choice to, to we have to accept that invitation. Um, Jesus did it, then we have to accept it, and we have to follow him and live our lives to him. You know, <clears throat> now, when I mean, you think about this, now, in verse 10 through 13, God will skip uh, forward to the millennial kingdom of something that has not been fulfilled yet. Because it says in verse 10, it says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. No Ephraim can be another name for Israel. So you know that. Uh, yours may have something. You may have Israel in your translation. And the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak of peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, this is the role of Jesus on the earth in the millennial kingdom. We don't just we don't see that now. So that part is just it's a future event. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit, return to the stronghold of prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. That, that's good. Double can be good and it can be bad. For I have bent Judah as my bow, and I have made Ephraim its arrow. And I will stir up your sons of Zion against your son, your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Now, some believe in this even in verse 13, this has partially happened in the days of the Maccabees. When uh, God raised up the Jews to fight against the successors of the Alexandrian Empire, uh, but most do agree that what they're what they're speaking here is uh, this will be an end time promise, and in, in the future God tells them, "I will be as a weapon, and and they will be empowered to overcome their enemy next to them." So they're going to be fighting next to Jesus, with Jesus, not with him, but with him in a sense of in unity against the enemies. Uh, verse 14 says, The Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, and the Lord will sign the trumpet and march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. Now, if you have noticed the reference of the trumpet and the reference of the appearing over them speaks of the second coming to their to their defense. 
Uh, verse 15 says, The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour. They tread upon the sling stones, and shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. And on that day, the Lord their God will save them and the flock of his people for the jewels of his crown. They shall shine on, shine on his land, for how great is the goodness and how great is his beauty. Grain shall be, make the young men feel flourish, and new wine the young women. Now see, God is saying here that there will be a great deliverance for his people, starting with the triumphal entrance and him setting up his kingdom. But what they are not told here is that there will be a great period of time that will occur between <clears throat> the triumphal entrance and him setting up his kingdom. And that will occur before everything is fulfilled. They call it the church age. We are living now in the church age. And it's been going on for over 2,000 years. And no one knows the hour of the day of his coming. But see, the, the church or the Jews never saw the church, the church age. Christians need to understand that the church does not appear in the Old Testament. We just don't see it there. We are the body of Christ. The New Testament is written for us. And the Old Testament was written to instruct us and give us insight. But we are the church. Don't appear there. You can't find us in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written to Israel for instruction, prophecies, to the coming of Messiah. Both comings. The first when he comes and then at, at the end. Now I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that the Old Testament has no use for us. But it was specifically spoken to his people. His people, the Jew. Plain and simple. Now, we can get comfort and direction. We can get wisdom and we can apply it to our lives. But the church does not appear in the Old Testament. God never speaks to the church specifically in the Old Testament because it does not talk about the church. Now, think about this. When Apostle Paul, when we know Paul, who was Paul was, right? Uh, Pharisees are Pharisees. He Highly educated man. Um, we know that his name was Saul of Tarsus. He came to know Christ on the road to Damascus. So we know that this man had a head full of knowledge and he knew he knew the Old Testament. He knew it. And when Paul spoke of the church, he called it a mystery, an unrevealed truth. See, if the church was mentioned in the Old Testament, it would not have been called a mystery. Paul was saying, well, this was a brand new thing. And understand that. And, and, it's a, and it's okay. A lot of people who you can always glean off the Old Testament. And that's what we, we do as believers. We learn from other people's experience. We grow from their tragedies. We grow from their blessings. But we have to understand those that was a love letter to his people and guidance and instructions. Let's go to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is this. Is, is that... <clears throat> is basically caught up with the Lord, will take care of his people, and, and there will be some confronting. Um, verse 1 says, uh, Ask for rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain. From the Lord who, who will make up the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain. To everyone who to everyone with vegetation in the field, for the household gods utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give up empty consolation. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They're afflicted for lack of shepherd. It starts off with this. Ask the Lord for rain, and you will receive it. Kind of my, my paraphrase. The people were geared towards idolatry, and the idea of these little statues they would bow down to, to and they were responsible for giving them rain and sunshine. And God had to speak to them saying, Listen, I give you the rain. Don't look to these idols who lie to you. They can't speak to you. And you listen. You listen to these false prophets because they don't tell you the truth. Come to me. I'm out, out and ask me and I will give you what you're asking for. And it goes back and says, Therefore the people wandered like sheep. They are afflicted for a lack of a shepherd. Now the whole picture reminds us when Jesus was on the hillside. Remember in, in the New Testament, Jesus was on the hillside and, and was looking over the city of Jerusalem. Right about the same time of the triumphal entry, and he wept over the city. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, how I have longed to gather you, and you have 
you will have none of it, and your house is less desolate. Roughly 35 years after Jerusalem fell, about 70 AD, this is what happened. Jesus, seeing the people as the sheep without a shepherd, and mentions that several times. The shepherd feeds, protects, and leads. That's, that's a major, what the shepherds usually did. They took care of the flocks. When, when, a, when adversity came, or a wolf came, or uh, a predator came, the shepherd would, would push the, or defend the, the, the sheep, protect them. But he also would lead them and guide them to where they needed to go to get water, to get fed. To You, you know what a shepherd does. And because his people were drawn away, looking elsewhere for other answers, or getting their answers in all other places, rather than coming to him to, to find the answers, they, he considered them a um, sheep without a shepherd. Even like our world today, though, how many people are wandering around looking for answers but going to the wrong places? Look at, look at, look at all, you know, even look at this in the church as a whole. How often, you know, instead of us diving into the Word of God and seeing what God says, we go and listen to different preachers, different teachings. You know, we get this all this collage of different people's thoughts and, and beliefs, and we try to pile it together to have our own theology, but in God's saying, listen, come to me. I'm your shepherd. I'll, I'll teach you and I'll guide you. You know, and and it, it's it's dangerous that we go out and we listen to 15, 20 different uh, teachers because we all get different opinions. But verse 3 says, My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock and the house of Judah, and I will make them like majestic steed in battle. See, God is saying that I will watch over you, and my anger burns against the leaders. This is not a reference where God is saying to his leaders, you have not gotten it done. And see, we need to glean off of this. See, Jesus confronts the leaders, even in the New Testament, by calling them whitewashed tombs. They didn't care for the people. See, the leaders didn't care for their leaders, they, or for the people, but they only cared for their prominence or what they could get. All they cared was what, what they could get from the people. And, that, and that's sad. That's almost like a hireling. You know, you have someone, uh, he, he's, he's not really part of, he just comes in, he does it for a paycheck, and he leaves. That's a hireling. Doesn't care for the sheep. Doesn't, doesn't sacrifice for the sheep. Doesn't protect the sheep. Doesn't feed the sheep. And it says in verse 4, From him shall come the cornerstone, and from the tent peg, from him and the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. We know that Jesus is the cornerstone. The cornerstone can be seen like an anchor stone in the rest of the building. Remember, Jesus was the chief cornerstone that was rejected. You know, I remember even in construction when when you could when you pour your footers down before the house is built, the bricklayer would find a place where the if the foundation wasn't say perfect, uh, they would find the one place where they would set up where they would level the house from. That would be kind of the, the, the cornerstone, the main one. And then he would build up his corners. Uh, <clears throat> It's interesting though, in verse 3 references, uh, he will come from the tribe of Judah, and we, we know that. Uh, verse 5 says, they will be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud of the streets. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame the riders on the horses. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them, and they shall be though I had not rejected them. And for I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. Then Ephraim shall become like a mighty warrior, and their hearts shall be glad as it with wine. Now, let's stop here for a minute. Not drunk with wine, but be glad, giddy. But having their senses, they're excited, they're, they're passionate, they're, they, 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 they see something better coming. It says, their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them, and I will gather them in, and I have redeemed them. And they shall be as many as they were before. Now, even Ephesians speaks of us, and even in chapter six, that we could draw uh, from uh, from his from his um, from his resources uh, for strength and for power, and that's what we should be doing. We should be drawing from him and nothing else. Because verse nine starts out and says, "Though I scattered them among the nations, yet as far countries they shall remember me, and with their children they shall live in return. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt." And gather them from Assyria. And I will bring them from the land of Gilead and Lebanon. Till there is no room for them. 
He shall pass through the sea of trouble, strike down the waves of the sea, and the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. I will make them strong in the Lord, and they shall walk in his name, declares the Lord. Powerful words that the Lord is saying that I will take I will take care of them. And once again, these prophecies give us again, they speak of a time when Jesus comes back and begins to reign. This is after the tribulation period. God will restore Israel. Know that. There is there is a there's something for the church and there's something for Israel. Now remember, if you have any questions, um on anything we talked about, don't hesitate to, to, to email me or send them in and we can discuss them. Even if you have a question, we can discuss them next week. That'd be good. Chapter 11, this is the chapter where we will talk about uh, the nation uh, of Israel who reject the Messiah and that judgment is going to come. Now, Israel's that nation, but they knew from the prophecies in the scripture, but they still turned their back on him. Like today, people know, people know why we celebrate um, it should be Resurrection Sunday, uh, or we, uh, why we celebrate Christmas. Yeah, we know that Jesus wasn't born on December 20th, but we know that. But we know he was born, and and you know, and people still turn their back on that. Um, we know that Jesus went to the cross. We know that. We know he died for all of mankind. You know, we know he died, but yet a lot of people re uh, turn their back on that. And you know, and this will be a time when God will bring judgment on those people. Who have blatantly, they know the truth, but they turn their back on God and on his word. You know, <clears throat> does a prophet come out of Nazareth? Does he come out of Galilee? You know, look it up for yourself. Check it out that, you know, even, even the leaders back then shut him down. Um, they weren't even taking the time to find anything out about Jesus. And because of their attitudes and the rejection uh, of him, they completely, you know, they re Total rejection, judgment will come. And, you know, we all will stand before God. But I'd rather be standing before him on the good side than on the bad side. Uh, when we stand before God, it'll be a time when we sit before the Bema seat and we will take an account of what we've done when we gave our heart to Christ and then till we, till we, till we die, until we go home with him. Where on the other judgment is, it's his final judgment. It's like separation from God. So, you know, I you know it, it's hard to to it's hard to see why you know how can you turn your back on somebody you know who is who is God? How how do we, how do we turn our backs on Him? Chapter eleven. Uh, it says the flock doomed to slaughter. Uh, open your doors, verse one. Open your doors, Lebanon that the fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O cypress, for the cedars have fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the, shep the, wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. Now the Lord begins to speak again uh, to Zechariah. Thus says the Lord God, Become a shepherd, the flock is doomed to slaughter. Those who buy, um, buy them, slaughter them, go pun unpunished. Those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord. I have come, I have become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them. Meaning, their own shepherds, their pastors, their leaders. They have, like, they have, so th that's where we're going with this. I understand that. For I no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into, into the hand of his neighbor. And each into the hand of his king, and they and they shall crush the land, and I will deliver none from their hand. Verse seven. So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed but to be slaughtered by the sheep traders, and I took up two staffs, one named favor and the other named union. Yours may say unity or some scent of of, of that word, and I will tend sheep. Now these two staffs were something symbolic. God wants to say to His people. Who have rejected him. The ESV calls the second staff a union. Like I said earlier, you may have union, unity or, or something just along the same lines. Now the staff of favor describes the favor he gave the nation and protection. 
Now the staff of the union, or unity, describes a connection and protection upon the unity given to Israel and Judah. And it says in verse 8, it says, In one month I, I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. Now, some, some don't know, we don't really know who the three shepherds that they're referring to here is. It's, it's not really clue, uh, clear. There were some that say maybe it's the prophets, the, the false prophets, the priests, and the kings. We don't know. But these are, are pretty strong words here um, to this nation in whom God poured out his heart and they rejected him as their Messiah. You know, you know, have you ever poured out your love for someone and they just totally spit on what you've done or what the, the kindness that you've shown? This is kind of what God's going through. But this is a picture when Christ the shepherd of their soul who created them and whom they detested. They detested Jesus Christ. Because verse 9 says, So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is it to die? Let it die. What is it to be destroyed? Let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour flesh to one another. Now, prophetically, during the fall of Jerusalem, if you remember, uh, we talked about in the earlier chapter where Jesus said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem. And remember when the when Rome actually laid siege um, to the city. And what's interesting about a siege, it takes time to do the siege. It's not like it's an overnight thing. So they build a run so no one can come in and nothing can go out. And what happened in that, that if you studied on, you need to study this on your own. As Rome sieged against them, uh, the people started to, re to resort back to camp or to resort to cannibalism. Just to stay alive. But it's interesting though. The Lord prophesied this 500 before. A little bit 500, 500 before it happened. So that's, that's what we're reading here in verse 9. And it says in verse 10. And I took I took my staff of favor. and bro Or staff favor. And broke it. The annulling of the covenant that I made with the peoples. So it was annulled on that day. And the sheep traders who were watching me. Knew it was the word of the Lord. Zechariah now Zachariah is, is, is playing play acting um, as kind of uh, as the shepherd as the flock over him. Now Zechariah takes the staff which says favor in front of the people who understood the symbolism and breaks the staff while they all watch, which meant the breaking of the favor of God had that God had given to them, the protection, and the Lord now is taking his hand off of them, off the ones who had rejected him. He says, like, you know, you reject me, I take away from you. I don't know if I would ever want uh, the hand of God to be lifted off of my life. I don't, I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, you can't imagine, you know, think about your life before Christ. You know, where would you be today if you, if you didn't walk with Christ? Where, where would your life be? Think about that, though, that the Lord's hand would be lifted off of you. I pray that doesn't happen to anybody. That, that's tough. But he says in verse 12 and 13, it says, Then I said to them, If it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if, if not, keep them. And they weighed out them my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Who else got who else got paid for that? Let's, we're going to talk about that. And then the Lord said to me, Throw it into the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord. To the pyre. Now, this is what it was an interesting prophetic message. If you really think about it, because we can kind of, as you read your Bible, you can put everything together in your head. But Zechariah, who has been strengthening these people, saying to them, "If you think it's best, give me, um, give me my pay. If not, just keep it." They paid him thirty pieces of silver, which really was not a lot of money. It wasn't a lot of coin. Um, but it says, "Throw it to the potter." Uh, prophecy was when. Remember when Judas was paid uh, for the arrest of Jesus? Remember, uh, Judas led them to the garden. He set up the circuit. They set up a circus trial, and then we know that they crucified Jesus. But you know, later we, we read in the Bible that Jesus, uh, Judas was seized with remorse, and because we're going to talk about the Potter's Field, uh, and he tried to return the money, and, but they wouldn't take it back because it was blood money. Uh, they realized it was blood money, and so what they did was they bought a a, a field and as a burial place for the poor and it, it really does sound nice thing to do but they bought a potter's field 
And you're probably saying, okay, well, why is it so bad that they bought a, you know, they made a, a cemetery, we'll say, for people who couldn't afford to get buried? What's wrong with that? See, the thing is, is when you study the potter's field, uh, a potter was one who made pottery, cookware, uh, plates, stuff like that. And when a potter was working on a, on a pot or a vase, the clay would, if the clay would not um, cooperate with him, or it does not yield to the hands of the potter, the potter would break it and then throw it outside the shop in an area that would be designated the potter's field. That's the place where the pottery would go when it would not yield to the potter's hands. Basically, a trash area. It's where all the, 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 the broken pieces, it's where the pieces that were no good, they had no value, they were trash, they were garbage. It's interesting, in Matthew chapter 27, verses 6 through 8, says, But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful for us to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and brought, bought with them a potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. It's interesting and significant here that in chapter 11, where God is speaking of the judgment that's about to come to the nation, that has rejected their Messiah. This is a picture of Israel. Now listen, who had, who has, who was fashioned and shaped by their God, and and they would not yield to them, so they were broken. God had not has not totally rejected Israel forever. That will have an opportunity again. Now the church is the center stage of attention right now, but right now Israel was broken pot who would not receive their Messiah. They would not yield to God. Remember all the remember the classes we had in the past where we talked about God's people always being in bondage. God's people always following false gods. God's people idol, idol worshiping would do more customs to, and they wouldn't follow the standards that God had set up for them. Now, now that they're broken, and we know, we know that Israel is broken. In verse 14, it says, Then I broke my second staff of union, acknowledging the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Then the Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a full shepherd. Behold, I am raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed or seek the young or heal the maimed or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Woe to you, worthless shepherd, who deserts their flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered. Let his right eye be utterly blind. Now, some of the people, as, as we wrap this up, some of the people out there see this as a fulfillment of the Antichrist. Now, listen, Israel was cast aside like a broken piece of pottery. It's true. They didn't yield to the Lord. They didn't surrender to the Lord. They didn't accept him as, as, as their Messiah. They would not yield to him. Now, they've been kind of put to the side, and maybe, I don't know, this is just me. You know, they've been put aside until the tribulation period, when God takes up the issue with them again. You know, a lot of different denominations look at the tribulation period a lot of different ways, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, and end time. Um, that's another subject. But I believe the time of of the tribulation will be a time where God once again begins to open up. There's a dialogue between him and his people to bring them to the knowledge of Christ and who Christ was or is. And I think that's 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 an important time that we have to understand. Um, I don't believe that the, the, the church will be going um, through the tribulation period I believe we'll be caught up with him and in, in the heavenlies. But for this for this prophecy here, um, God will, will God will take care of his people and he and he he will approach them once again and, and deal with you know deal with them. But I believe after the tribulation period when it talks about woe to my worthless shepherd, um, you know, let his arm be wholly withered and the right eye be utterly blind. Um Meaning God, after the tribulation, when God sets up his millennial kingdom, that God himself will be the shepherd for his people. That 
he himself will, will be here to take care of all of his all of his people, and that's something we we can be excited for because we're we're gonna be part of it. We're we're gonna be with Jesus, and I don't know what everybody's gonna be doing, but we know that there's gonna be a time of ruin and reigning, and there's gonna be a time of celebration. There's gonna be a time of worship. There's gonna be a time of praise, and there will be no sorrow. There will be no pain. There will be no suffering. You know, even when we talked about earlier about. Uh, when Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom, kids will be playing, you know, games around him and, and running around and playing. And, and it'll be a time where where God will set up the way it was supposed to be since the beginning. But that's but that's it for uh, for tonight. Uh, that's the last that's the 9, 10, 11. And we will Lord, when we'll finish up the rest uh, next week. And also, if you can kind of read ahead, read ahead. Uh, get your ideas, your thoughts. If you have any questions, send them in. But also look into the book of Malachi. Will also be that'll be the last of the the minor prophets. Um, so let's pray, Father. Lord, we thank you for your your mercy, your grace, and Lord that you bring comfort to our hearts, Father. And Lord, as we continue to read through what you what what these words that you've given to us, Father, help us to glean off of the lives of the people. But Lord. Help us to continually grow stronger in you, Father, that our intimacy with you would grow deeper. And I thank you for the people that have joined us tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep your hand upon them, that you would breathe life into their situations, Father, and that, Lord, that they would know that they are never alone, that you are always with them. I pray this continually your hand of blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Be blessed and Lord willing, we will see you Sunday. Remember, we'll be here Sunday for Sunday service. If not, we'll see you next Wednesday. Be blessed. Bye now.